help us understand how bioprinting can really uh, represent a change in many different fields of uh, application in the biotech world. So uh, as you probably read uh, in our uh, latest email, there was a slight change of plan, so plans. So Dr. Aza Shapira will be not presenting, but instead we will have the pleasure of having his uh, colleague, Eric Silberman. I would like just to spend a few words on our speaker. He is, of course, uh, also a researcher in Taldvir Lab for Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine at the University of Tel Aviv. And he is uh, graduated uh, with a BSc in Chemistry from uh, uh, Rice University in the United States and then an MSc in Chemistry at the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His research focuses on developing a novel advanced bioink formulation to print clinically relevant engineered tissues, and he will share his experience and the one of his lab in the following presentation. I would like just to give you a, a few uh, technical notes. So uh, after my this small introduction, our speaker will um, tell us more about this application and then we will have a Q&A session. And to this purpose, I invite you kindly to uh, use either the chat or the Q&A tab that you can see in the bar uh, above your screen to uh, write down any question you may have during the presentation. And then in the end, I will uh, moderate it and uh, ask them uh, to Eric without uh, uh, needing to uh, activate too many microphones and uh, create confusing situations. Of course, this webinar is recorded, so you can find the recording uh, afterwards. And uh, I take the opportunity to thank you again, Eric, for being here, and uh, we are ready to start whenever you want. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, and, and thanks to all the organizers for putting this together. Um, as uh, as Mao said, I'm one of the researchers in uh, Professor Tal Devere's lab for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, um, and we now have um, many years of experience with uh, 3D printing, uh, and in particular 3D printing biologically relevant tissues. And today I'll be speaking uh, in particular uh, 3D printing of personalized cardiac tissues. So um, just to give a, a little bit of, of background on uh, the need for cardiac tissue specifically, um, not a surprise, I'm sure most people know this, that we're transitioning now from the world of infectious disease um, to, the, um, to the new frontiers of cancer and heart disease. And the leading cause of death in the Western world uh, is heart disease and a significant, perhaps the most notorious contributor uh, to the statistics there of people that um, that die each year of heart disease is people that suffer from a heart attack. Oop, jumped a couple of slides there. Um, so a heart attack or myocardial infarction uh, is an irreversible and uh, progressive condition. It begins when uh, one of the cardiac arteries that feeds the heart is blocked, and that can be from calcium deposits. It can be uh, built up of fats and cholesterol. Uh, but in any event, one of the uh, major arteries will eventually be stopped, leading to ischemia, a lack of uh, oxygen feeding the tissue, uh, and progressive cell death. And at that point, there are sort of two major problems that I want to highlight here. Uh, the first you can see, oh, I don't know if you can see, hold on a second, let me put on a laser pointer. Uh, the first you can see is that after the heart attack occurs, uh, that area can end up spontaneously being uh, ruptured being pushed open by um, the weakening of the wall. The heart wall where the heart attack occurred is weakened uh, and the blood flowing through there can simply cause it to rupture. And that obviously uh, leads to instant sudden death for, uh, for the victim, for the, uh, for the person who's had that experience. The other thing that happens, and this is, uh, thank goodness, uh, the more common path, uh, is not the spontaneous rupture, but the uh, over time scar tissue buildup leading to a uh, much thinner wall uh, and a very fibrous wall that doesn't have any of the functionality that we expect from uh, from heart tissue. And so when that scar tissue is there, you have now uh, progressive loss of function in the heart. Um, and so. Um, so, uh, one of the reasons for, um, 
for this is that the cells themselves, the heart cells, have no ability to regenerate. There's no self-regeneration of the heart. Uh, and therefore, um, as much progress is being made in the field involving things like pacemakers and uh, uh, cardiac assist devices, if, if we don't regenerate the tissue externally, we won't be able to get uh, real tissue regeneration. And therefore, uh, our lab focuses in large part on regenerating cardiac tissue in the lab uh, for ultimately regenerative medicine to help people who have experienced uh, a heart attack. Uh, this is another view of the heart attack. Um, this one is a little bit harder to see maybe, but in the upper left portion here, of this heart where I'm circling it, you can see the development of scar tissue. It's it's white fibrous tissue. It doesn't have those healthy cells. And again, those cells will never be able to uh, divide and repopulate the area um, that they're there. This, uh, sorry, I didn't say this. This heart is a sheep's heart, this image here. Um, this is a, another image of, um, of a heart attack. This one's in a human heart. Uh, and you can see here the rupture that has occurred in the lower right corner of this image. So two images just showing what I uh, explained earlier. So the current uh, treatment for uh, for these heart conditions, as I said, there are devices that can help a little bit, but because there is no cell division, ultimately the gold standard, the only real treatment option for people experiencing end stage heart failure is to have a heart transplant. Uh, this graph here shows kidney, um, transplant recipients and people on the waiting list, the same statistics are true for the heart. In fact, for the heart, it's an even more serious problem because any living patient can donate one of their kidneys and the heart, you need uh, a dead donor in order to perform a heart transplant. So people are waiting for hearts. Um, I, many people every year are dying on the waiting list, uh, having never been able to receive the heart uh, that they need. And there are several reasons for that. One, as I mentioned, is that for heart specifically, you need a dead donor. The other thing is that you have to have the right heart. The fact that someone has died and is willing to donate their heart doesn't necessarily mean that you can be the uh, recipient of that heart because of immune rejection. You have to have someone who, who matches you in several uh, immunogenic criteria. And even if you match, even with all of that, uh, you are going to be on a regimen of immunosuppressants and it's a major cause for failure and for needing a second uh, or third transplant for uh, for other organs for heart. I don't know that um, people are uh, having heart attacks young enough to uh, get to a second or third heart, um, but it's a major problem for for organ transplant in general. So the solution that uh, that we work on in the lab and that many scientists in the world are looking at is using tissue engineering to grow and engineer these tissues in the lab so that they can then be transplanted, implanted into the patients who need them. Um, and this obviously has to look a little different for the different types of tissue, whether we're talking about um, skeletal muscle or heart muscle or smooth muscle, whether we're talking about the nervous system, developing spinal cord implants, uh, brain implants, epithelial tissue, which is all kinds of different uh, organs of epithelial tissue, whether it's kidneys um, or... Um, or the retina, uh, and all of these tissues have both their unique cell types and their unique ECM, what's known as the ECM, it's the extracellular matrix. Um, and it is in a uh, conversation with the cells. So the cells in a particular organ are excreting the proteins and sugars that make up the extracellular matrix. And in response, the extracellular matrix is also giving cues to those cells so that they know how to behave in order for the tissue to mature properly and to function properly. Um, it's made up, as you can see here, the main component is the collagen fibers. That's the main protein, uh, but there's lots of other components in it. And then you can see there's also these proteoglycan um, uh, complexes coming off of the collagen, which are sugars and proteins that are combined together. And uh, in our lab, um, we spend a lot of energy on uh, on using the right extracellular matrix. Um, I would just want to show you really quickly that the extracellular matrix, um, in terms of its communication with the cells, this is what a single cell looks like in its ECM. When it's happy, it's forming really strong connections with the extracellular matrix, with those proteins, giving and receiving signals. 
Uh, and the x Brazilian matrix is, is quite a significant amount of material. Uh, this image shows a rat's heart on the left with cells and on the right after it's been fully decellularized. Uh, and you can see that even though it's now white, it doesn't have that cellular material. It's still that same shape that can be uh, really supported and held in place by the ECM. Uh, so putting it all together then, the cells in the ECM, the, the model for tissue engineering uh, is to take cells, ideally from that very patient, uh, to expand the cells. These are turned into uh, stem cells. I'll speak a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, to culture the cells, to mix them with the proper matrix so that they can develop and organize into a tissue uh, and ultimately have a full tissue for transplantation, implantation into the person. Um, just to show you really quickly, this is an experiment that uh, we published regarding the importance of the ECM. Um, this is a, uh, a mouse into which was transplanted three different ECMs. So you can see here on the left, this was a pig transplant, so it's a xenogenic material from a different species. Here was a transplant from a different type of mouse. So it is, um, it's allogenic. It's not, um, it's not from that same mouse, but it is still from a mouse and there's significantly less response. Uh, and then this comes from the same mouse. And so you can see that the injury at the site there, the inflammation is significantly less. Um, this, this experiment was done without any cells. This is just showing the response to, um, to the ECM itself and, and shows the importance of using autologous materials, not even just the cells, but even from the ECM itself. So our process then, um, all in all, looks something like this. We uh, have developed a technique based on the omentum. The omentum is the layer of fatty tissue that covers the internal organs, uh, and it can be safely removed. It's removed as a common part of uh, certain surgeries. Uh, and people can live without it. So we can take that tissue and we can separate it out into its two main components, the cellular components and the ECM. The cells are then reprogrammed to become iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. Those are cells that have a, a potential to be differentiated into all different cell types. And from there, we can take them and, and make them into uh, all sorts of different cells, whether they're neurons or cardiac muscle cells or endothelial cells, which are blood vessel cells. Uh, and all of that is done, the, the IPSC uh, reprogramming here, it's a genetic engineering that we perform on the cells, uh, and then we're able to differentiate them. Meanwhile, the ECM we process to become a temperature responsive hydrogel. You can see here that it is uh, a liquid at lower temperatures or at room temperature, and at 37 degrees, when it's incubated at physiological temperature, it becomes a robust solid gel. So we're able to print it uh, at a malleable state and then have it uh, solidify afterwards to form the tissue. Um, and of, of course, I completely forgot to say that one of the uh, one of the things that we need to do, obviously, is before we print, mix our cells. Uh, with the ECM so that we have our bio ink, cellularized bio ink, uh, in order to uh, print them all together. It's also uh, worth noting that when we do that, we have a completely autologous bio ink made up of autologous cells and autologous ECM. We can then take it one step further. What you're seeing here is um, a CT image of an infarcted human heart. And from that image, we extracted the major blood vessels and then incorporated other smaller blood vessels and made that into a two-dimensional shape that could be printed out. And in that way, this shows you an example of creating not only an autologous uh, system in terms of the cells, but one that is both personalized to the, um, to the patient and their heart architecture. In terms of the printing, uh, here's what it looks like then. Here's the design you can see. We use our uh, custom bio ink that we that I just described to print out some uh, some of the cardiac, the parenchymal tissue, the cardiac tissue itself. And then you can see here these sort of longer stripes. Those are the blood vessels. It's being printed out with a second separate bio ink. We have two different uh, bio inks going there. One of them is for the parenchymal heart tissue, and one of them is for the blood vessels and contains the endothelial blood vessel cells and a different type of biomaterial. In this case, uh, we were printing with gelatin, which uh, has opposite properties from our ECM gel. I mentioned earlier that it at 37 degrees solidifies gelatin, of course, liquefies 
at high temperatures. And in that way, we can use it as a sacrificial material in our printing in order to create the hollow lumen, the hollow blood vessel structures. Uh, here's another picture of the printed cardiac patch. Um, here you can clearly see where the blood vessels are in it. And not only is it something that we can print and look at, we can obviously manipulate it. We can work with it. It can be lifted. Uh, and when we place it back into solution here, you'll see it sort of unfolds again. We can perfuse it in the bottom image. Those blood vessels are open, perfusible blood vessels that we can run uh, blood through it. Up until now, what I've shown you uh, is 3D printing, but really it's it's 3D printing of non-volumetric structures. Uh, we sometimes think of it as 2.5D printing. That is, we're, we're printing something using our 3D printer, but we're not printing it with an incredibly uh, high height. It's not a volumetric structure. It doesn't have any hollow spaces within it. Uh, and if you want to imagine printing a volumetric structure with our very soft gels and soft materials, you can immediately see that we'd run into a problem. The first layer, no problem. The second layer, no problem. But once you get to a few more layers, the whole structure will collapse. It doesn't have the strength to support itself. So one of the uh, other things that we're really proud of that we've developed in the lab is our own formulation for something that's called printing in a support material, uh, in a support medium. This is a uh, practice that's used to print volumetric structures. And you can see it works in four stages. Um, the first is printing out the material within the support media itself. The second thing is uh, having the material that we've printed solidify cross-link at 37 degrees so that it no longer needs the support material. The third is to remove the support material, and at that point we can culture the, uh, the printed tissue in its growth media. The important thing about this support material then is that during the phase when it's soft and malleable while we're printing it and shortly after, we are negating the effects of gravity by having something there that can support our material uh, against its own collapse. Uh, for our purpose, we needed a, uh, a particular type of support material. Um, all inks have different properties, and so we had to develop our own uh, in order to be transparent which means that we can see what we're printing and we can make sure that it looks the way we want it to. Obviously, it has to be cell friendly. Uh, it has to be stable at uh, 37 degrees because we need to be able to put our tissues in the incubator for them to solidify. So we had to develop a material that can be put in the incubator without melting away. Um, it has to be something that we can then remove afterwards in a very simple and, and easy way without disturbing the cells themselves. Um, so we developed that material, um, and uh, you can see here that the material we developed is a mixture of alginate and xanthan gum. Both of those are uh, naturally occurring non-animal uh, sugars, which is also uh, a, a great benefit for us. It makes it much easier to get FDA uh, approval for, for, for those sorts of things as they don't come from animal sources. So uh, alginate is um, from algae, um, and uh, xanthan gum comes from uh, bacteria originally, but both of them already have FDA approval for use in uh, food and, and different types of uh, cosmetics and medical uses. So it's a, it's a very self-friendly material. Um, and, uh, and it gives, as I said, um, just to highlight that, that one of its real benefits is the transparency, uh, that we're able to see what's happening while we're printing and adjust the system uh, while it's happening to ensure an accurate calibration of uh, the print volume and print speed while it's happening. Um, just to show you a, a little bit here uh, how it works without going too much into the, the physics behind this, um, is that to imagine sort of like a ball pit that kids play in, uh, that the material as it's being extruded from the needle here goes directly into that ball pit and, and all of those tiny particles, they're micro particles of our uh, alginate xanthan uh, mix, those micro particles of alginate are there to support the material during its printing. That enables us to print a variety of really complex structures. You can see here what the printing looks like, in this case, printing uh, the shape of an ear within the, uh, within the support material. Um, here you can see the printing inside it of, um, a grid crisscross structure, 
Um, this one you can see we've mixed now with the material. The last one, let me go back one, sorry. Uh, this one here you can see is completely transparent clear. Uh, here it's red and that's because we've mixed this now with cell medium. So we can formulate it just by using uh, buffer, but we can also use cell media with different factors in it. However, we want to formulate this, uh, this micro gel in order to suit the needs of that printing. Uh, so you can see here is the printing and then once it's been uh, released from the support afterwards, um, we can uh, get rid of the support and it floats there very nicely. Um, and that's after the heating to 37 degrees once it's been um, once it's been cross-linked and solidified. Um, the uh, these two images are just two more kind of complex geometries, fun structures, uh, the hand reaching out here. And then, of course, uh, the Champions League, as we're gearing up, we we uh, reprinted this last year for the championship game, um, but gearing up again for uh, maybe we'll print a new one for for this year's final. Uh, and in and in any event, they're quite ooh, sorry, they're uh, easy to remove, as I mentioned uh, in our case, in the case of the alginate and uh, xanthan support material, uh, alginate is not a human uh, sugar. As I said, it comes from algae and therefore it can be enzymatically removed using an enzyme called alginate lyase that cuts the alginate and doesn't have any impact on the human cells that are in the human tissue, uh, which makes it a very easy and cell-friendly process to remove it. Uh, this is the printing then of uh, a full uh, heart-like structure uh, to show the, the possibilities of the technology here. Um, we took a, uh, a 3D model of a human heart um, and um, we simply miniaturized it in order to uh, to make this printing video, but it is uh, a 3D model of an actual human heart. It has all the major uh, blood vessels in it, and you can see we're printing here with two different uh, inks, a red and a blue. We've added food coloring just for the purpose of the demonstration uh, so that you can see where the two inks are for the printing. We can also look at it in kind of a, a few different views here. One of the benefits of the printing is that we can choose to print certain layers and not others. Um, it gives us a very high resolution as we're printing. And so you can see here, uh, the top left is the full heart model. You can see on the right, just printing a few different slices of it. Here's a slice looking at it from the top view and you can see that it has the four chambers of the heart. They're open. I'll show you in a second that they're entirely perfusible. Uh, and you can see here as well the uh, coronal slicing, whether we print it only with three layers and so it's a much more delicate structure or more layers and it becomes a much thicker and more robust structure. As I mentioned, those chambers are really open. They're fully perfusible. Uh, so this is a demonstration of that. Um, the heart here is, uh, of course, without the food coloring. Uh, this is the the color that it actually looks like once it's printed with the with the cells in the ECM that Omentum ink, uh, but without the uh, food coloring there. So you can see the the ink moves through the entire heart structure there, um, and that's being done um, just with the heart after it's been incubated at 37. It's been solidified, uh, but the next thing that we need to do for our purpose is make sure that the heart is also maturing properly and that it beats as a heart. Uh, and so here we have, although it doesn't seem to want to play, hold on one second. Let me see if I can. Oh, no. Well, believe me, it's an incredible video. Um, I'm going to, uh, as soon as I, I just have a couple more slides here, and as soon as we finish, I'm going to go back and see if I can fix that video so I can show it to you. Uh, but I do want to just continue for uh, for a few more slides here and show you what we can do beyond the uh, the standard tissue, because one of the benefits of using our 3D printers, uh, our support material, our cells, our, all of our technology together, is that uh, we can think of things to do that normal native hearts don't have. Uh, and in particular, we take that in the direction that we can combine our hearts, our, our cardiac tissue, with electronics to create cyborg tissues. So the first generation of cyborg tissue um, was uh, the most simple device you can think of. The metal here, the electronics component, were created in a clean room the same way that semiconductors are made using basic photolithography techniques. And on top of that, we electrospun these fibers that mimic the extracellular matrix. And in that way, we were able to create a very simple uh, cyborg tissue. 
The second generation then became more advanced, and instead of just having a simple uh, electronic system, we added in specific nodes. They would be for sensing the heart, for stimulating the heart, and even for drug release. And we envisioned, therefore, that this will ultimately be useful, that a doctor would be able to log in, as it were, um, see the heart through a wireless connection. Here you can see, obviously, that it is, in fact, wired but a next generation might be wireless, can log in, can see what's happening in real time to the patient's heart and can respond to it, can provide stimulation or drugs um, and, uh, and see how it's all working. Obviously, it's also possible to do that before it's been implanted to make sure that the printing uh, and the maturation and all the stages were completely successful and ready for transplantation. Uh, the, uh, the last thing then that, uh, that I wanna show you is our third generation of cyborg tissue, which is moving away from using the uh, the photolithography techniques, and it becomes a one-step printing of cardio tissue with incorporated electronics. And so here you can see is the printing of the uh, electronics. These are the the uh, output nodes here, which are connected to the electrical source. Here's the printing of that ECM gel that we've already discussed with the cells, uh, and then printing here of a conductive material to form the electrodes and covering up again those electrodes filling it with more parenchymal cardiac tissue to create a cardiac tissue with built-in uh, electronics and it's all done in one step printing as one process uh, with that then we have the tissue again it's a robust tissue it can be picked up uh, it can be twisted around you can see here the uh, the electrodes are flexible and soft uh, and enables us to manipulate the material and, and have it really serve as a cardiac um, tissue that we hope to uh, reach the clinic at some point with it. Um, and uh, anyhow, these are um, just the two projects that I wanted to, to show you here. We have a lot of other uh, projects happening, a lot of other printing of, of different tissues and different types. And uh, with that, I'll just say thank you very much again to the organizers and to Tal Devir. Um, and his lab, uh, all of our funding sources we're very grateful to, and um, I would be happy to re to thank uh, also as well Regenu, of course, in particular, uh, for organizing this, and uh, I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Eric, for the wonderful uh, presentation, really. So uh, while we wait for uh, some question from our audience, I again invite you to write them down in the chat or in the QA section and uh, please do not hesitate and be shy. Meanwhile, if I may, I would like to break the ice with some comments and questions. So uh, as you were just mentioning in the end, uh, so the approach you developed now, you are applying it to cardiac tissue engineering for a very clear reason and the focus in your research and the great need that is there in this field. But I see it as a sort of universal, very translatable approach that could be applied to all sorts of tissue. And also the support printing that you showed. Now you're using a thermal gelating material, but the transparent uh, support buff could enable also to use, for example, light activated material. Do you have any experience with this uh, kind of application? You work on other tissue, other cross-linking chemistries. You can share something. Yeah, thank you. So, um, first of all, I, I, you're exactly right that uh, that this is a, an incredibly versatile technology. Um, we in the lab work on, uh, we have projects relating to uh, kidneys, which uh, we do 3D printing and development of tissue engineering uh, for, uh, for uh, renal tissue, for kidneys, uh, the retina, we have small intestines, um, different neural projects involve, involving both uh, motor neuron involving, well, many different neurons, but involving both uh, central nervous system, uh, spinal cord and brain, and also motor neurons uh, happening. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of the, the types of cross-linking, um, we have printed with, um, with materials that are, that are responsive to light. Um, we one of the one of the most significant benefits of the material, as I mentioned, is how transparent it is, which enables us both to see and to uh, to do the cross linking. And so we've done also uh, some work with materials that cross link not thermally, but but with light. And it's um, it's easy to uh, 
to do so because of the transparency. It's also, I'll, I'll just say as another benefit of the transparency, it sometimes happens uh, as you're printing that you need to stop and make a, a change, a correction that something didn't print right, some ink, maybe the needle got clogged as you were printing, uh, because we can see exactly where it is. It's possible to, to go in with a pipette and to sort of suction out just that particular piece and then continue printing without having to throw it all away. Um, so there's lots of benefits, I think, to this particular system and uh, not just for uh, for for cardiac tissueing, but for for any tissue engineering and and for any for printing with with any expensive materials that you don't want to have to print, get to the end and find out you've wasted all of your material. OK, thank you. A lot. I, I see we have a raise then, so if you. Uh, you want to share your question, please feel free. I see a question in the chat. They ask if uh, it is uh, uh, infection prone. Uh, no more than than any other biological uh, material. Uh, we we work. Uh, all of our printers are are inside of sterile biological cabinets uh, so that we can prevent contaminations. All of our work with cells is done uh, sterilely. There's there's nothing about this that makes it more prone to. Um, to uh, to contamination, but of course, uh, whenever you're working with with biological tissue, it's uh, it's an unfortunate uh, uh, part of the work that we have to be very careful with um, uh, with the work. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I see another question. They ask, uh, what type of cells do you take when you print arts, cardiomyocytes, or another source? Um, yeah, we're we're working with uh, with iPSCs. As I said, we're we're taking uh, omentum cells, cells from the fatty tissue there, uh, genetically engineering them to be pl uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, and then differentiating those stem cells into the different cell types that we need. So um, for for the examples that I've shown here, using uh, iPSC derived cardiomyocytes and um, and endothelial cells, blood vessel cells. Uh, but we can also differentiate them into neural cells and print uh, neural tissue. We can differentiate them into um, the uh, the cells of the uh, of the kidney tubule of the nephron and print out nephrons. All sorts of different um, uh, projects that are happening, uh, and there are lots of protocols for these different uh, differentiations. So we were able to both to develop and to follow protocols and make sure that we get the appropriate cell types. Uh, another curiosity on the cells, they ask what's uh, the passage level of your cells? Um, it's a great question. It it varies. Um, if we're talking about something like cardiomyocytes, is just to remind you that they themselves are not differentiating. So the passage number would be the cell passage for the stem cells. Uh, and then once they're differentiated, they're no longer going to divide. Um, our stem cells um, vary. They um, they tend to have um, a limit. They're they're a, a true ideal stem cell. Let's say um, can self renew indefinitely. The reality of working with cells in the lab is that no one can do it forever. Uh, at some point it stops. So uh, we have some limit to the passage, but uh, they divide quite nicely, and we're able to to use them many many times uh, without uh, without having to to get new cells and start over. Okay. Um, and maybe I will uh, pop in another small question, technical curiosities on the printing process. So uh, the material that you are formulating, I imagine, are quite low viscosity. That's why the need for the support gel. So have you encountered uh, any issue in optimization concerning, I don't know, needle size or is it uh, you um, there is a preferred technology pressure driven versus other mechanism that you found out was really uh, helpful in driving this uh, printing process. Uh, took some time to optimize the protocol. Or... Yeah, uh, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a part of any uh, any 3D printing process is the fine tuning, uh, the calibration to the particular use uh, it, it is. Uh, it's a complex process and, and you can't just say like, oh, well, I know I'm going to use this needle at this pressure. It's going to work perfectly for me. Uh, every material has its slight uh, nuances that need to be addressed. Um, so um, we um, 
we don't really um, have so many problems at this point. We've, we've done the calibrations. We print both with uh, pneumatic uh, systems and also with mechanical uh, ex screw extrusion systems. Um, both work really well. Um, in particular with the uh, pneumatic, I would say, uh, whenever you're using air, um, you have a uh, higher risk of, um, of something getting clogged if you don't have a screw pushing it. Uh, and then you have a, a small, um, uh, uh, I'm only thinking of the Hebrew word now, goosh, block, Look. something that blocks the uh, the needle, you can really run into problems. And that's where um, I think the, uh, the support material that we've developed has been uh, really important to our success there because it's clear and because you can see what's happening and, and therefore make those changes, like I said, to, to sort of erase mistakes. Uh, we're able to do the fine tuning during the printing and uh, and I think that really helps us a lot um, in uh, in terms of uh, of our success with different with different techniques, the, the ability to see and correct while printing. Thank you. Another question. Uh, they would like to know whether the uh, in this case it was not gelatin, the support material microparticle uh, uh, attach or merge with the printed structures in any way or the uh, removal is uh, no, the removal is is very clean. Um, we often see when we uh, when we perform that um, that enzymatic removal um, that um, that we get a a very very small uh, negligible amount of material really uh, is still there, but it's not a material that um, that our cells can adhere to. Um, it's not a it's not a human material. It's not something that the cells can adhere to. So it it can't really interact too much um, with the with the cells. Um, and then again, because we're able to use an enzymatic degradation technique, um, we can come in to the um, to the to the structure with our enzyme and and cut apart and and really really break apart the alginate fibers and polymers so that even if something had um, infiltrated a little bit or when we're printing a hollow structure so it is really inside the tissue because we've printed around it once we've cut apart the polymer using our using our enzyme um, it's uh, it's very easy to to fully remove it uh, without having anything left um, and that's um, and that's again a, a function of having developed it from non-animal sources um, that whenever you're working with ECM polymers or their derivatives, gelatin, for example, is derived from collagen. Uh, they're going to interact more easily with the ECM itself, and, and you'd run into those sorts of problems there. Uh, but because this is coming from alginate and uh, xanthan, we're able to, to really remove it cleanly uh, from the structure. Okay, then uh, we have just other two questions uh, before we let you go. <laughs> and the, the first one, if, is, if that fulfills the natural physiology of the art, uh, we saw the picture, we were not able to see the video, but I guess that would have been another proof in that direction of the. Uh, Let me, can I share? Sure, absolutely. Um, can you, can you see now the, the yes. heart there? So oh, here's yes. the, I don't know why it didn't it didn't play in the presentation, but here's the, here's the video as it was supposed to work. Um, this is not a complete heart um that uh that you're looking at here this is actually just the left ventricle um and i just want to be sort of clear as i show this um that this is not something that that we're ready to um to implant into a patient tomorrow um this is this is not at that stage yet um there's still a lot of challenges still to go uh, but but just to demonstrate the the potential that this has uh to really be a, a source of full uh, full hearts, full organs, 3D printed uh, using this technology. OK, and then I, I will go for a last one. Uh, if your momentum based bio ink uh, show compaction like collagen, uh, and if you are able to keep the shape of the microstructure within the model that you printed, or you find some collapsing or a contraction or. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely something that occurs. Uh, in particular, the cells are forming these tight interactions with the ECM, uh, and so that's a that's a really good thing. It shows that uh, the cells are are really happy and comfortable there. Uh, and as a result of their interactions and their pulling, we do get uh, compaction 
uh, and and contraction of the of the whole structure. Um, another thing to say about that is that one of the things that we want to happen in our tissue engineering is that the cells themselves will start putting out their own ECM that they're generating. And so the ECM that we use, the Omentum ECM, is not the, the final ECM there. We want it to be uh, little by little um, broken apart by the cells and replaced by their own um, ECM. So uh, when we print something without cells, we, we don't see really any compaction, any changes um, to the structure. Uh, with the cells, we, we get that compaction. Uh, but it's not. Uh, it, it there are. I'm sure there are. There are applications where it would be a where it's a challenge to to overcome. Uh, but it's also something that that is just uh, indicative of um, of it being a good environment, a good micro environment for the cells to develop and mature, uh, and uh, yeah, and for the tissue to to function in. Perfect. So Eric, I would like to thank you again for your time and for the wonderful presentation. It was thank really you so much to learn more about this. And uh, of course, for any further question, I think people are more than welcome to contact you and your lab to find of out course. more about your research. And so I wish you and uh, all the people who, that were attending this event a nice afternoon and uh, look forward to the next one. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.